Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is restoring prairies, peatlands, and bison. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertsen. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you, Sunny, and welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying your Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm calling in from Saranac Lake, New York in Adirondack Park, and it's definitely uh, peak foliage here. Uh, so it's it's a beautiful weekend we're headed into. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about prairies and peatlands, and in particular, what bison can teach us about ecosystem restoration. And just to give you an overview of today's chat, we'll, uh, I'll introduce myself and then we'll do a little bit of Climate Solutions 101 because a lot of what we're talking about is how these ecosystems can be such big climate solutions. Uh, next, we'll look at the case study of restoring bison. And finally, we'll see what that can teach us about uh, other restoration efforts. A um, little bit about, about my background, I started in uh, a field of research studying uh, softshell turtles. And while I was studying softshell turtles, I got really excited about communications and photography. And that's really led me to a career where I feel like I've got one foot in the scientific community and one foot trying to share that work with a larger, broader public. And most recently, that was on the Climate Solutions exhibit up here in the Adirondacks, which has brought me to live in this gorgeous part of the world. And that really also led me to start uh, my own uh, project once that exhibit was uh, concluded, uh, working at Two Line Studio, uh, which is a digital marketing company. And uh, I've gotten to work with incredible partners, and one of those partners is Natural Habitat Adventures and World Wildlife Fund. And so that kind of just brings me to the topic today, which is kind of this intersection between one of those ecosystems that I guide in is Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and there we have this incredible success story of a fully intact ecosystem. And what I mean by that is all of the key predators and prey species are still present on the landscape, the same ones that were there uh, during the pre-colonial times. And a big part of that is because of restoration conservation efforts. Uh, and so we'll be bridging that conversation with where I live now and one of the ecosystems that has huge potential in fighting uh, climate change is uh, our northern peatlands. So uh, we'll see if we can bridge all of that in this uh, short chat. But it all starts with a little bit of Climate Solutions 101. So there are essentially two pathways for climate solutions. We can either reduce emissions or store more carbon. We need to do both of these things. And an uh, organization that if you're not familiar with, it's really worth checking out is Project Drawdown. This is a graphic that they have that essentially shows the emissions going into the atmosphere. Those, those emissions are from electricity, food, agriculture, land use, industry, all those different sectors. And then on the right side of this graph, we have sinks. So areas that pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it. And so today's conversation is really gonna be working on the right-hand side of this chart and thinking about how we can store carbon. And it really comes down to how we can support and restore our natural ecosystems. Our planet has an incredible ability to store carbon and we can play a role in helping the planet to do what it does best. And so these natural ecosystems, there's this incredible process called photosynthesis that is actually drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it in the tissue of plants and then in the soil and in our waters. And the natural function of these ecosystems helps support this natural function of the planet and by restoring them and by protecting certain species, uh, we can start to really enhance the ability of these systems to help us in this, in this fight against climate change. So that brings us to the next chapter, restoring bison to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, a quick case study. Some fast facts about bison, just to get us excited about this amazing animal. 
they weigh up to 2,000 pounds. They, you know, if you measure them, they're seven to 12 feet in length. They're a herd animal and they prefer grassland habitat. Uh, there once were between estimated numbers of 30 and 60 million bison in North America. They stretched all the way from southeastern Alaska down to north northern Mexico and across to the eastern seaboard. They covered this continent and they were hunted to near extinction uh, during European colonization. And they got down to the point where there were only roughly hundred on the order of hundreds of individuals, roughly 500 individuals. And uh, through restoration efforts, uh, once they were identified as a species of concern, uh, we have 20,000 individuals today. One of the big uh, advocates and, and current workers in this area of re restoring bison is World Wildlife Fund. And as you know, World Wildlife Fund is a partner of Natural Habitat Adventures. And so, uh, you know, one of the big things that we know about bison uh, this charismatic fellow right here, is that they are actually ecosystem engineers. And this really gets into the carbon story. And bison themselves are engineering what is called uh, by ecologists, the green wave of green spring. So what is the green wave? In the springtime, as everything starts to green up, it greens up in elevation and in latitude. So the further north areas, those green up later, further south areas green up sooner, and then lower elevation areas green up sooner. And so a lot of the wildlife are actually following that green up because the plants are most nutritious when they're brand new, when they're, when they're really young. Um, and so the animals are actually following, this is what we call the green wave, of the most nutritious plant matter as, as it is growing on the landscape. But what's interesting about this is that wave is more powerful and is actually existing because of bison. So this was a really interesting study. Uh, here's a, a article that's, that's diving into it, how bison are actually engineering this green wave. And the way that they got to this is fascinating. Uh, so just a little bit of history of understanding wildlife movement and research in the field. We're at this point where uh, our tools are becoming incredibly powerful to allow us to ask and answer questions that we never could have asked, uh, you know, 50 years ago. So with the advent of uh, GPS collar technology, we can see animal movements in real time. Um, and then you pair that with some of these new studies that are using LIDAR, which essentially is a sensing system that sees more than the visible range, the spectrum of light. And then you pair that LIDAR with data on the ground that researchers have collected about plant growth and plant health, and you can start to map out. So all of that jumble of a mess of a description to say that researchers know on the landscape when it's greening up and then they also know where the animals are moving in relation to that and that has led to this green wave hypothesis and then it's also led to understanding that bison are actually creating this so the way that bison graze is different than most animals they come through an area and because they're such a large herd animal so many individuals together they really intensively graze and they mow everything down really low and then the key is that they move they move on and so as they're moving across the landscape they're fertilizing it with their uh, scat they're actually aerating it with their hooves and the plants respond by growing more aggressively and with more nutrients and ultimately this stores more carbon in the soil so where bison are present we're storing greater carbon. So all the animals that rely on this green wave actually have bison to thank uh, for their forage. And because of that aggressive feeding and then moving on, they create this amazing growth throughout the spring. And they actually create additional waves. As bison move through, they'll eventually come back to an area and br browse again. 
and that encourages another round of growth and then these animals come and enjoy uh, that further growth so that's that's really getting to this idea of bison as an ecosystem engineer and as you can imagine when we removed bison from the landscape that was not happening anymore and so we had reduced carbon storage in our soils. We don't have data of this. We, have, we weren't measuring carbon in the soil at the time that bison were removed from the landscape in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, but we do have evidence that suggests that because bison are on the landscape, they're actually storing more carbon. So this is leading to another idea. So just unpacking, this is another article from Nature Climate Change released in 2022, uh, 2023, sorry, this is a really new article, uh, trophic rewilding. So the idea that trophic means food chain. So the idea that you can reintroduce a species into a food chain or a food web, which is really what we're calling it now, and that can actually increase climate solutions. There's an amazing study looking at cougars and, and mountain lions and their impact on the landscape and it's trying to, it's suggesting that because cougars are making kills and the way that they eat their food and that food decomposes in the landscape, that that is actually creating little pockets, little islands of greater carbon storage. So the presence of these animals on the landscape is fundamentally changing the way that the ecosystems function. And so here you're just seeing this article that's, that's pointing to this idea and showing that if we can restore our ecosystems, restore all of these trophic systems that used to exist, this article is claiming that we can prevent climate warming beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, which that's that Goldilocks number that scientists have decided that if we go beyond that, we'll have catastrophic change that's gonna be irreversible. And so we're trying to stay within that window without going above 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this is from that same study over here on the red dot, you're actually seeing bison and elk, and they divided this by both ecosystems and the animals that have the biggest impact on those ecosystems. And so the grassland habitat number four in North America is really shaped by elk and bison. Today, we're talking a lot about bison. So this, is, this paper is essentially saying, if we protect these species, it will have an outsized impact on our ability to store carbon in this landscape. So it's a really exciting area and we're starting to see a, a greater correlation and a, a relationship between biodiversity and climate science. And so we're hearing a lot about you know, the next great extinction and losing all these animals. And we're actually learning that if we, saw, we can solve both of these problems by um putting in one solution uh, so it's 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 really exciting research and here's the bottom line uh bison encourage plant growth plant growth encourages soil carbon stored over time therefore bison cool the planet uh, some quick transitive properties there uh, so as yale scientists put it uh restoring the bison's landscape even to a fraction of what it once was could add an estimated 595 megatons of carbon annually to prairie ecosystem. If we look at a prairie, you know, you think of the grasses on top, but if you've ever seen a cross section of the soil itself, you see how those plants just have incredible root systems. And those root systems are home to microbes and all of the life that exists in that area it stores carbon in it and it has this ability to, to sequester more and more. And so by bringing bison back, by restoring our prairies, it's a huge climate solution. But here's where the story is starting to shift and here's where we're starting to get that tie between what can we learn from bison and how can we apply that to other ecosystems. And a lot of my work lately has been focused on northern peatlands. And so my big question is what happens when there isn't a charismatic megafauna species to rally conservation efforts behind? Going back to this graph from scientists, if you look at these species, whales, giant tortoises, um, oxen, most of the animals on this graph, with the exception of a couple, are big animals that when we see images of them, it inspires us to action. We see a polar bear and we think, gosh, 
let's find a way to save that animal. But sometimes we have ecosystems that don't have that big charismatic wildlife. And so it almost is uh, more on us to try and champion those ecosystems and rally people in support behind them. And so that brings us to Northern peatlands. Now, I don't mean to say to me, uh, especially coming at it from being a uh, science a researcher on softshell turtles and amphibians and reptiles, I get excited about what I call charismatic small fauna, right? Uh, but not everybody is going to, to stand up and, and get behind salamanders. Uh, so part of what I'm working on right now is trying to show this incredible ecosystem and transport people to this place and get them excited about uh, the potential of this ecosystem. So headed back to that drawdown graph, right, where we have emissions on the left, carbon on the right. We just talked about prairies. That is a on this graph, a land sink, meaning it, uh, it's not in the ocean and it stores carbon. Now, here's this long, long list. Project Drawdown is really cool because it's the first comprehensive list that we have where if we scaled up and put into effect all of the solutions that they've listed, we can ensure that we have a livable climate. We can solve this massive problem of climate change. And they've gone through and they've done scientific studies of each of these solutions and they've looked at the most studied areas. And the one that I've highlighted here in orange is the 12th largest solution that they've cataloged. And that is uh, peatland restoration and uh, protection. So to give you a little context here, the big solutions that are above that in terms of impact that they can have and the way that they measure impact is by the millions of gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent that's removed from the atmosphere or prevented from emitting into the atmosphere. So essentially reduction in greenhouse gas emissions or storage of carbon. And so these solutions on the left are really interesting because you see wind turbines, that makes a ton of sense. Solar power, that makes a lot of sense. We're, we're hearing a lot about that. All of these solutions, I'm guessing you've probably read about them. But when we get down to the 12th one, which is a gigantic impact, most likely I'm betting that you've heard about peatlands in terms of permafrost and in terms of the giant danger that they present. Just to go back to our story with bison for a second, uh, here's that list again, not even showing all the solutions that they have. And we were just talking about prairies. We were talking about bison and how they have this incredible impact and they're kind of the poster child for carbon storage and soil carbon. But when you look at the amount of an impact that restoring and protecting our global grasslands have, it's, has the, it's on the order of 3.35 gigatons, which that's a huge amount, but peatlands are so much bigger than that, 25.4 gigatons. And the reality is we need to put all of these solutions into place. We need them all. One's not better than another, but it's noteworthy that we're not talking about this on a huge scale. So really we should be hearing more about peatlands as climate heroes. And yet most news coverage is about melting permafrost and how these ecosystems release apocalyptic levels of greenhouse gases. But rather than letting peatlands be villains, these ecosystems have the potential to be one of the greatest heroes of our generation. And so now we'll dive into peat 101. Peatland distribution, here's a map. Red areas show where you're going to find peatlands throughout the world. You find them at every latitude. There are very little representation near the equator, but they're present. And it only covers about 3% of Earth, so really, really small area. And yet it stores about 50% of Earth's soil carbon. So that's why it's making more sense in Project Drawdown's list of climate solutions, why it's so high on that list. Now, it's twice as much as our global forests. And let's try to understand this a little bit, little bit. What's going on? How are they so powerful? So this graph shows the process of peat formation. And it's all about the accumulation of vegetation 
and also the presence of water. So when vegetation is submerged, it decomposes incredibly slowly. And if there's enough vegetation, it compresses and it creates what we call peat. And these are this is just an example of how a raised or a transitional bog can be created. Uh, but this image here is kind of a peat core. So it's looking at a cross section down into the peat showing what it looks like, where you have living sphagnum moss on the top, some dead sphagnum moss, some slowly decomposing things, and then on the bottom, that's the real peat that is, uh, has, has reached a certain point of decomposition and stability in that ecosystem. Now, we we're talking about this incredible overlap between biodiversity and climate solutions, and that we can actually work to, to promote biodiversity, and that will be a climate solution. We'll start to work on this big issue we're facing. Now, peatlands are unique. They're ecosystems that have high acidity. They're really challenging to live in, but there are animals that have become adapted to living exclusively in these areas. So it's a biodiversity hotspot. And this is just a list of some of the species that rely on peatlands. And in particular, my focus is on the northern peatlands. If we go back to this global map, you can see that Russia, China, there's huge representation of peatlands there. And in North America, the concentration is uh, up in mostly in Canada. And then if you look at where I'm located, I'm in the southernmost extent of those northern peatlands. So everything to the north essentially exists in this northern peatland habitat. And I'm in Adirondack Park here. And one of the areas that I've been focusing on is Spring Pond Bog. And this work is really trying to transport people to an ecosystem that maybe they've never experienced before. They haven't heard a lot about it. And it'll go, it, this project is going to span years. It'll go through the seasons and document the this place. I'll be meeting with researchers and talking about their work and looking at how wildlife has changed in this place and talking in, in areas, venues like this about what makes these ecosystems so special because it kind of comes back to that idea of there isn't that huge animal that's going to go extinct if we lose our peatlands, but there are a lot of small animals that will. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping to try and shed light on uh, this incredible ecosystem. Now, just a couple more stats here. About 15% of the world's peatlands have been degraded. Uh, and that means a lot of them have been, have been drained and then converted to agricultural land. And what's interesting about that is that it's actually really inexpensive. A lot of that land is now followed. It's not used for agriculture. And uh, it's fairly inexpensive to re-wet that land and it very quickly can transition back into peatlands. So peatland restoration is one of those areas where in terms of restoration dollars, it's the biggest bang for the buck. It's very inexpensive and it has huge potential to help us uh, sequester and store more carbon. Um, the other piece of, of benefit of protecting peatlands is that they can actually help prevent fire, uh, forest fires. Uh, and they, um, so when we look at Canada, we've heard about all these wildfires that have been going on the last few years and the summer wasn't an exception. We had a lot of fires. A huge cause of that is actually because a lot of the peatlands have been drained. And some of these fires, if they get into the peat in those drained areas, those fires can exist underground for years. And so it's incredibly important for us to be able to restore these ecosystems so that they can maintain their function and they can also provide greater fire protection. So back to this graphic, we've been bouncing around on a few of these and you recognize it now. Up in the corner here, number 12 in North America, if we zoom in, is the beaver. So the beaver is kind of becoming that champion of wetlands of which peatlands are a subset. And beaver are another example of ecosystem engineers, just like bison, who are shaping this landscape and creating areas that water is held 
uh, in lakes and ponds. And that actually can help promote the formation of peatlands as well. So that is an animal, but in terms of like global appeal and people really rallying behind it, I think it's gonna be a tougher sell than, than the charismatic bison and elk. Uh, but maybe I'm not giving uh, folks enough credit. So that is a species to be aware of and to follow. Um, in terms of what we can do, uh, Project Drawdown offers these options to be able to find out uh, if the place that you work uh, has a sustainability plan and whether there's a way to uh, be able to support peatlands within that. Um, and then also finding organizations that are doing this work and finding ways to support them. If you'd like to stay in tune with the Northern Peatlands project that I'm uh, creating and uh, will be continuing, you can go to twoline.com slash tracks. That's my website. And you'll find uh, blog posts and you can sign up for a monthly newsletter to be able to learn more about this incredible ecosystem. Uh, this work that I've been doing, it'll be uh, featured an exhibit starting October 16th uh, up at St. Lawrence University at the Richard F. Brush Arts Gallery uh, with an opening on the 16th at 6.30. Uh, so stay tuned and, and if you follow me on Instagram, you'll hear a lot more about Pete and hear a lot more about some of these upcoming uh, pieces that we have. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Thanks for letting me uh, talk about one of my favorite topics. Uh, uh, which is peat and also the prairies and bison. Uh, and I'd love to open it up to questions uh, that folks might have. So thank you. Charlie, thank you so much. Um, we have lots of questions already, but I want to remind <laughs> everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so let me start at the beginning. Why doesn't free range cattle have the same impact? That is such a good question. Thank you so much. So uh, really great. So kind of going back into the ecology of bison and what we were talking about. Uh, so as bison move across the landscape and they are a herd animal, so all of them together move through an area and they mow everything down. It sounds a lot like cattle, but the part that is different is that then they move on. If cattle are just allowed to roam free, they're going to eat as much as they can and then they'll stay in that spot and they won't give the plants a chance to be able to regenerate. So there's this really exciting area of, uh, of study where we're talking about rotational grazing. And what rotational grazing is doing is it's, it's, it's moving these uh, cattle and other animals from a gated area of a pasture allowing them to graze there. And then they're looking at the graze amount and how much erosion there is, whether uh, the plants are still okay. And then they're moving the cattle to another section, giving that first pasture time to grow back. And then in the meantime, the cows are fed on this new section and then they move them back or they move them to a third field. Maybe they've got five different pastures that they're rotating them between. And that allows plants time to regenerate. It allows more carbon to be stored in the soil. So we're actually learning from wild animals, wild herbivores like bison, and we're starting to apply that into the way that we farm. Uh, so that's an amazing question and thank you for bringing that up. I meant to cover that when I was talking about that. Great. Um, is there no support for dramatic, quick increase in the number of bison? It seems absurd that there are only 20,000. Yeah, so it, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, Yellowstone National Park is the, the largest intact ecosystem uh, in North America. And um, it, when you look at how far bison used to range, which is part of your question, um, and the numbers, right? 20 to 30 million bison ranging all the way across North America. And now they're limited to a very small section. They're limited to about 1% of their total range. People are starting to look at switching out cattle for bison to be able to farm bison. And in that process to be able to uh, restore some prairies as well. Um, 
anytime we start to think about restoring large animals to a landscape, uh, there are a lot of stakeholders at the table who are in a discussion about whether these animals can live safely along people, uh, alongside people. What does it look like when there's a wild bison herd that interacts with town lines? And you have an example of that in a number of Western towns. I lived in Kelly, Wyoming, uh, which is just north of Jackson Hole, and the bison come down onto the elk refuge and they're very close to town and they're coming through yards and houses. So, uh, you know, it's a big conversation about uh, where do we want these animals? And the other part of it too is that to be able to bring them back across the landscape, right, across the country, it would require the restoration of ecosystems. So there are a couple places in the country that's that are not out west, like Kansas has a couple of locations where bison uh, roam, uh, but they're not allowed to roam freely. They're contained within uh, an area. And part of that is an ecological cont containment. You know, they're staying where they can find food and browse. Um, and part of that is actually fences, keeping them in. So it's it's a great question and one of those big sticky uh, issues that we'll keep discussing. Mm. Where are the peatlands near the equator? Oh yeah, they're tropical peatlands. Uh, so they're they're found just about everywhere. Uh, if we could zoom in on that map to a really high level of detail, you'd see little red dots all over. But um, there are some tropical peatlands wherever there's standing water and an incredible mass of vegetation. Those are kind of the requirements. And then from there, uh, it's the different vegetation types are subbed out for the the location where you are. Um, so up here, it's a lot of sphagnum. That's the primary uh, sphagnum moss, um, primary species that is creating the peat. But in other places, it's tropical tropical plants. Mm. And does harvesting peat for commercial peat moss sales play a large part in degrading the peatlands? Yeah, so uh, yes, the, the farming peat and burning peat are a quick way to degrade the land. There are instances of sustainable harvesting. Um, the big concern is, is draining the peatland and then converting that peatland to something else. So back to that stat from the beginning, 15% of our global peatlands are degraded. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have been paved over by malls and some of them have been converted to housing developments. Those ones are gonna be really hard to get back. Um, it's the lower hanging fruit, uh, such as ones that have been converted to agricultural land that are no longer in operation. So maybe it's just a field that is no longer providing food. Um, then there are also these other solutions that are looking at, okay, how can we take a peatland and actually grow crops in tandem with that land um, as a way to restore peatland. So if you have an area that used to be peat and is now farm, but the farm is not operating, you can re-wet it and then find areas that you could grow certain crops like cranberries um, and farm it. So it's, it's not a, we need to set aside land and not touch it. There is an aspect of that. There will be some places uh, like this place that I'm photographing that it will be our, in our greatest interest to set them aside. But there are other examples, especially in the realm of restoration, where we might be able to restore a place, create a recreational boardwalk that goes through it that can help with education around these ecosystems. Um, and then also we can potentially farm it and get some of our key crops uh, from it. Hmm. Can you speak to what it feels like to walk across a peatland area? Oh, it's amazing. Uh, it's a good question, too. The best way to experience it is to go barefoot, but uh, sure that it's just like a, um, uh, it's part waterbed and part just a sponge. So as you're stepping, you can feel yourself displacing the water around your foot, and it kind of goes out in a ripple effect. You won't see it on the surface, but you'll know that the water is moving through this saturated sponge and it's pretty amazing 
the first time that I really walked out on a peatland, um, there are places where you can sink in up to your waist and if you're not careful further. Uh, and, and a lot of the vegetation from an area that feels fairly stable where maybe you're only sinking in four inches or so to an area that's really unstable, it doesn't look any different on the surface. Um, so it's it's uh, really uncertain. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is aerial photography with drones and part of that is to reduce my impact on the ecosystem so that I'm not walking across it. And part of that is that it's really hard to travel across peat. Uh, it's it's uh, a little bit dangerous if you're alone. It's, um, uh, you know, you're taking these trudging steps. Uh, so I highly recommend it. It's amazing. Uh, to, to if you're able to do it without harming the ecosystem. Uh, but there are a lot of places where you can get, get on a boardwalk and be able to explore that way uh, without harming the, harming the plants. Hmm. So interesting. What do we know about Russia and China's attitudes towards protecting and restoring peatlands? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of what I've focus on right now is North American peatlands and, and looking at this particular ecosystem. Um, so I'd, I'd have to do more research to find out what uh, efforts are being done. I do know that um, organizations like World Wildlife Fund, global conservation groups are looking at the landscape and saying, where is the area that is in the greatest danger and where is the area where there's the greatest opportunity? Um, and one places like World Wildlife Fund are working with local communities to be able to bring those solutions from the local community and, and put them in place. I guide in Michoacan, Mexico to the um, monarch butterfly migration. And on, on that trip, we get to learn a lot about how World Wildlife Fund and local communities have come together to be able to um, transition from a primarily timber harvesting economy towards an ecotourism economy that helps support this incredible migration and overwintering grounds of the monarch butterfly. So I think there are a lot of organizations who are working on restoration at large. Some of them are working on peatland restoration and some of those are global. Uh, to, so that's as far as I can kind of answer that question. That's a good one. Okay. Do you think that ecotourism um, would help encourage peatland protection and restoration without harming peatlands? Is that is it possible <laughs> to yeah. create more ecotourism opportunities without harming what you're trying to protect? Absolutely. So this place that I've been visiting uh, is open to the public w with a pass uh, from the Nature Conservancy. And there's a boardwalk that be, allows you to get out onto the peatland to be able to experience it. And there are a lot of very small scale peatlands or bogs or wetlands that have a lot of the plants that you would find in one of these northern environments. And, um, you know, throughout uh, many different places I've visited. And, and uh, so I think that there's huge potential for um, educating around it and bringing people to it to be able to experience it. Uh, one of the one of the biggest barriers is a, a couple of things. One, um, the bugs are really bad. <laughs> uh, it tends to be no matter what warm season you go, spring, summer, fall, um, a lot of black flies, a lot of ticks. And so that tends to keep people away. But I can imagine, a, you know, a, a group of people, uh, you know, an educational institution that would rent out bug nets to help people get out there. And I think another barrier too is um, that these places are hard to understand. And some of these images like on this screen right now, these aerial shots, um, go back up here. You know, it's, it's just a lot of plants that we haven't experienced before and um, this wet habitat that in some ways we have this long cultural history of thinking of bogs as these dangerous places, will o' the wisp, all these kind of fairy tales of, of don't go in the bog, it's a dangerous place. And even, you know, a lot of time, for a lot of time, there was a belief that you could get a lot of diseases just by breathing bog air. 
Um, and so I think there's been a long history of, um, of fear around these ecosystems. And I think that's starting to shift and they're starting to become a much greater appreciation for these places. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to be, to be seeing that as well. Project Drawdown lists wind and solar power as solutions, but not nuclear power. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the Project Drawdown, it's, it's not the end all be all of what climate solutions are. I use them as an example because they're one of the only places that has a comprehensive plan to be able to address climate change. Uh, so they have essentially a decision matrice that tells them whether a solution is included. I know that nuclear power is one that they're researching, but it's a very tough issue to research because they're trying to um, include in their analysis, essentially looking at um, human impact, uh, impact to society, and so they're trying to figure out how do we layer in that solution when you've got waste, you know, uh, that uh, that could be incredibly dangerous to ecosystems. And what, where is that waste going? Nuclear waste, and what do we do with it? And what's the solution? And there are solutions out there, uh, but I think that that's been one that they've shied away from. Their their purpose isn't to list every single climate solution. It's more to list the solutions that are actionable right now that are tried and true and that, that help support people, communities, wildlife, and the planet. Um, so they kind of have a decision-making uh, preference there. And so that's probably part of why that's not listed right now. Hmm. What role do private landowners and large Western land holdings play with bison ecosystem restoration? That's a good question. Uh, it would probably depend on uh, where where the private landowner is located. Um, private landowners are voting, you know, members of the public. So, in the same way that everybody has a kind of a contribution to our our natural resources policies through our vote, um, you know, that's that's a big way. But there are a lot of examples of private landowners with large tracts of land. Uh, who have private bison farms, whether they're farming them or just having, you know, restoring them, they've worked and gotten permits to be able to do something like that. And there are a lot of examples of people restoring prairies um, and trying to uh, trying to convert land that's that's uh, been degraded uh, back into these restored ecosystems. So a lot of different pathways there, but uh, kind of tough to answer without more specific examples. <laughs> um, one of our viewers says that um, they have noticed a lot of peatlands being destroyed. Is that a big part of why so many areas in the states are flooding? Or to what degree do you think that is affecting the increase in flooding? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, um, it's a little it's tough to answer you know peatlands when they're functioning properly they do help with storm water they do help with maintaining a water table um, in particular a lot of the flooding that we're hearing about uh, is due to just intense storms you know un, unprecedented floods and flash floods and unseasonable floods as well as the raising sea level um, and having storm water issues and uh, storm surges. And so peatlands would help in the sense that if we address global climate change, we would then uh, you know, have a, a better chance of, of reducing these extreme weather events, which would help reduce flooding. But um, peatlands do on a more micro level where they exist and they are functioning properly, they're helping to purify the water, they're helping to stabilize the water table so that there aren't these extreme fluctuations. Uh, so that, you know, and then in terms of people degrading them, um, oftentimes they're degraded or uh, drained uh, to try and reduce insect populations or to convert it to different 
types of land. Mm. Uh, there, there are some pretty amazing historic uh, books published uh, that you can find that outline, you know, 10 ways to drain a swamp. Uh, and and uh, the government for a while, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, was out carrying out a lot of these projects to be able to drain what was thought of as this dangerous quagmire of mosquitoes. Interesting. Do you have an update on the large Russian peat fires? I, I don't have an update right now. I, I just know, you know, similar to the Canada fires that I've been following, that because we've dried our peatlands and uh, converted that land, they're no longer serving as that buffer because the, the, the saturated land would serve as a buffer if there is a forest fire in the area to, to stop that forest fire in its tracks. Instead, these dry peatlands or areas that are converted are just fueling that fire. They're, um, the peatlands themselves are burning because they're um, you know, exposed to the air. Peat is a great um, accelerant. It's a great uh, material to burn. We, we burn it for heat in different areas of the world. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's definitely playing a role, but I don't know the specific story in that location. Mm. Um, do you have any ideas or suggestions about how to inspire people to, you know, take an interest in, in this? Yeah, I, I, I would say if, if someone has the ability to see a wetland or to go on a boardwalk at a bog near them, that that is one of the greatest ways. And if you can do that with someone who is knowledgeable, that would be the best possible way to get excited about it or to get people interested. The next best possible way would be to uh, uh, to learn more about this ecosystem. There are a lot of great books. Um, there's a book about beaver restoration. There's a book called Wetlands that's great. Um, and movies and folks like me writing about these places and photographing these places, kind of sharing the word, um, getting folks to sign up uh, for, for this type of communication. Um, I think those are great ways. And then um, Looks like I cut out for a second there. Yeah, you froze there for a second. Sorry about that. No worries. I think I was rambling, so I can I can let that answer <laughs> sit. <laughs> we just have a couple more questions. Um, is quicksand a form of peatland? Is what a peatland? Quicksand. Are they related in any way? I I think I had the same question pop up when you said like sometimes you know it's dangerous to walk alone because you can step in and and get sucked down in. And I had this, a similar image of the my childhood. I feel like quicksand was a big deal when I was little. You don't hear about it much anymore, but is there any relationship? Right. Names for wetlands and for bogs and for peatlands. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I've, I've never heard any connection with, uh, with that. <laughs> All right, last question of the day. Um, a number of indigenous tribes are bringing bison into reservation prairies. Are there any studies um, observing the progress in restoring ecosystems in those areas? That's a good question. I'd have to look specifically at that, but I know it's being studied in many areas on bison farms, on areas where they've been reintroduced. So I'd, I'd have to check on that, but I'm, so I'm not entirely sure, but I bet someone's looking at it. Mm. Well, that's the last question we have for today. So I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I uh, really appreciate your time. And thanks for journeying through the prairies and peatlands today. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about peatlands, feel free to go to uh, my website and sign up for the newsletter. And uh, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the, enjoy the fall weather. <laughs> Thank you again, Charlie. Your, your presentations are always so interesting.
Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.